So I, I'm Mark Gorley. I'm a rheumatologist. I was in practice uh, at the National Institutes of Health. I retired last July, and, and I'm retiring those golden years, just like you all are too. Aren't, aren't they a lot of fun? Um, I wish life would have turned out a little different, but you know, we get dealed these cars, and I'm glad that you're all playing the deck the best we can. And, and one of the things I'll tell you right now is you want to know as much as you can about what you have because knowledge is power. And if you have power, you can deal with things a lot easier. And I think we'll all do better in the end, too. So I am not doing the best. And uh, I'm not going to stand up. I'm going to sit here with your permission. And I'll use the handheld microphone. And we're here to talk about the environment. And I labeled this the environment, the influence in autoimmune disease. And if I was going to talk about just myositis, we'd be done in three minutes, because there ain't much out there. And there's not a whole lot out there for most diseases when we study the environment. Now, I worked for several years with Fred Miller and Lisa Ryder, uh, who a lot of you people may know, because they helped form this organization. And our task was to examine environmental causes for autoimmune diseases. So there was a person who well, I just met who uh, participated in one of our studies. Where did he go? There, oh, Tom. So did I enroll you, or who enrolled you into the study? Uh, Dr. Miller did. Dr. Miller did. Yeah. And how many years ago was that? Two years ago? Two years ago, yeah, because I left his group in 2007, and they were short a person. I was with them for six years, and then I became the director of training at the National Institutes of Health for rheumatologists. So one of the things that a rheumatologist should know is about myositis. You think that's a good thing? Darn right it's a good thing, because we want our doctors to know how to take care of myositis. And we want them to know how to take care of them effectively, efficiently, and not hurting them. And one of the things we do at the NIH is we see people from all around the world. And you should know about the resources at the National Institutes of Health. So there's always a lot of people who feel that they, they're not getting the answers or they're looking for someone with expertise that they just can't find. And there are several clinics in the United States where you can go, but the National Institutes of Health is a very large referral for most diseases in the United States, and they have a large recruiting office, and you can uh, be seen if they accept you into, the, into a, one of their protocols. And if uh, you're interesting enough, they may fly you up. Uh, but myositis is not interesting enough, but you can go to a the NIH and be seen, and uh, they may do poking and prodding and EMGs and MRIs and this, that, and the other thing, and try to give you the best opinion that money can buy. And the best thing is, it won't cost you a cent because you've already paid for it through your tax dollars. So I'm a firm believer that the National Institutes of Health is one of the best ways to support the government, and that for every $1 that goes to the National Institutes of Health. In return, they think in health causing, health savings, and effectiveness, we get about $10 in return. So it's a good investment. And because of the NIH, I think we have advanced in a lot of different ways. And myself, I'm a patient at the NIH. So I bring that up because a lot of people don't know about the NIH, and you should. Now with that, I have about 25 slides. We have an hour to talk, and so there's time for questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, and someone will come by with a microphone so we all can hear you and ask the question. And I'll do my best to answer, although there's a lot of things that we don't know. And the one thing that I refrain from answering is personal questions about your disease, because that's not, this is not the time or form that I go into that. So with that, let's talk about the environment and autoimmunity. And the environment is not just something that is something that occurs or is 
not very common or so common because you can go online and find every single day a new disease, a new environmental toxin, a new something that is associated with some type of illness. And it has waves of coming and going. And we need to really investigate this, but it's really, really hard. Because there, we'll talk about what is the environment. But let me give you a, a good example. Life events. Life events are part of what the environment is all about. How we deal with stress is a good example. Now, who here thinks death is a bad thing? Okay, because a lot of people think death is a bad thing. Who thinks death is a good thing? Who doesn't have an opinion or are afraid to raise their hand? Okay, because I can tell you, some people who lose a loved one unexpectedly think that's pretty bad. But some people who see their loved one suffering with a disease for years or even a prolonged period of time and passes away sees that as a good thing. So how do you rank death? Is that a good thing or a bad thing in the environment? And so one of the things that I'll talk about a little more is Dr. Miller's group is studying the environment and so we look for people who are willing to help us participate and we ask lots of questions. Because it's really hard to ask about you when you were born and how your childhood was like. So sometimes we get your mom and dad involved as well, if they're around. But here's one example, here's another example of what's going on, and children are the big hits sometimes. We really worry about kids, we worry about vaccines, are they good or bad? And I'll just sell that right now. Vaccinations are probably the best thing that we've ever done in the world to help eliminate diseases and we should all be vaccinated. And what's already in our body? You know, we, there's a lot of stuff in our body that we don't know about, but it's out there. We have no control over it. And one of the big things we're, we're talking about, autoimmune diseases uh, 10 years ago was estrogens. Estrogens are all over. They give estrogens to cows, they give estrogens to animals to help them develop more quickly so that we can uh, get the beef more quickly when they take them to slaughter. And so we eat that meat. And so whatever the cows eat, we eat. Whatever they spray on the anim on plants, uh, we probably eat that as well. So we, were, we wonder and want to make sure that all that stuff is safe. And even though we've studied things for years and years and years, all of a sudden, a decade later, we find, oh boy, this is all wrong, this is terrible, we shouldn't have done that. Well, science advances, and the passage of time is probably one of the greatest things we have to study. So let me tell you what I know about the causes of the environment and uh, causing autoimmunity, which myositis is one of them. And this is it. This is all I know about it. Somehow, and you'll ask your doctor, well, how did I get this disease? And the doctor will say, well, there's something about your genetic makeup and something about the environment that you live in. Somehow it came together and you got myositis. Anybody heard that story? I tell that one all the time. I don't know what causes myositis. Does anybody here know what causes myositis? How many PM patients do we have? How many DM patients do we have? How many IBM patients do we have? How many unclassified patients do we have? How many healthcare providers do we have? How many spouses do we have? Yeah, so you're living with the same thing that all the patients are living with, right? And sometimes patients get tired, they get hungry, they get angry, they get frustrated. Who do they take it on? They take it on on you. So we appreciate our healthcare providers. Let them know. So let's launch into this thing called the environment a little more and uh, see if we can dissect a little bit. So first thing I want to do is kind of define it because I'm a researcher, I'm a scientist, and when you talk about the environment, you want to know, well, how do you, what do you mean environment? Environment means a lot of things to me. Well, you can define things into things you control and things you can't control. 
in the macro environment are all the things you can't control. You can't control like how polluted the atmosphere is. Yeah, I guess you could if you want to move from New York to some place that's out where there's a very rural area and things not around. But in general, what's out there up in the air and in sky and in the soil can be found in almost all places. And the water, the water that we drink, unless we go to bottled water or we filter our own water, that's another source of whatever's there that we get in our body. So we want to make sure that's a good thing rather than a bad thing we put in. But what can we control? Well, we can control where we live. We can control how we deal with stress. I mean, who here gets really stressed out when things don't work their way? I do. Is that a good thing for us? Probably not. Makes our blood pressure go up, makes us get angry at things, and makes us snap, and, and makes us an unfriendly person. It's probably not the best thing for disease. Uh, how about the food we eat? You know, should we be eating a lot of trans fat and lots of fats that aren't make us gain weight and lots of things that aren't substantial good nutrition for us? Or should we try to think with things that are, have provide the essentials and the vitamins that we need? So diets are something we clearly can uh, control. In our workplace, uh, would you rather work in a place that the air is filled with silica or would you rather work in a place where you have clean air to breathe? So there are people who work in the construction cement industry that are breathing all these really bad things that we know cause problems. So there's the macro environment and the micro environment. So moon-mediated diseases are the dose diseases in which the immune system has kind of gone haywire and myositis is one of the diseases where our immune system is doing something we don't want it to. Because our immune system, we really think, should be protecting us. And in some cases, it's really hurting us. And in some of us, our immune system is looking at our muscle, and what's it doing? It's attacking it. It's destroying it. It's causing inflammation. It's causing the cells to die. And it's causing it to turn to fat. And that makes us weak. And it makes us not walk, breathe, eat very well. And there are hundreds of these different types of diseases. In fact, we know what cancer is. We know what heart disease is. But a lot of us don't know what autoimmune disease is. And autoimmune disease is the third most common disease out there, category of disease, and it's becoming more common. So while we're solving issues with cancer, and you know, I talk about, we all want to have hope for our disease. We all want to know that there's a chance I can get better. I'll tell you right now that your hope in, for muscle disease, I think, is as good as I've ever seen it in my lifetime. And the chance that people are manipulating how the immune system works, manipulating genes that are involved, and learning how to make muscle grow and to make it stop growing. So there is a lot of hope. And I had really good news two days ago and the fact that the FDA approved a drug which might be very helpful. My immune system isn't recognizing part of my body itself, and so it's letting it grow, la di da di da and on and on. Well, that's not a good thing, because it's killing my vital organs. But now, what they want to do with this new drug is they want to turn my immune system on, and they want to get it really, really angry. They want to get it so angry is that anything that doesn't look 100% like Dr. Gorley, it'll kill it. And so what's one of the consequences of this new drug? Autoimmune disease. So it can trigger the immune system to recognize things that we don't want it to, to turn on. So there's high rates of chronic illness and death from these diseases, and it costs a lot of money. And we really don't know what's going on to cause it, and we knew that the genetic component is important, and we know that the environment is important. And just some types of diseases that where the immune system's involved, you should know about it, is who has allergies? Because that's a direct response of the, of the immune system. Or if we take some drugs, the drugs actually cause a disease. And one of the diseases that I've studied for years is lupus. And we know that there are certain drugs that women can take that make the disease work. 
worse and it can cause the disease. Uh, the immune system, if it's not suppressed um, and can't resist in the way that it will, uh, uh, it, it's supposed to, then disease can set in. And there are specific types of diseases where the immune system targets one organ and causes problems. Anybody here with thyroid disease? So with thyroid disease, you can have problems where the immune system recognizes as foreign, it attacks it, it makes it go releasing all the hormones so you get hyperthyroid for a while, and then the thyroid burns itself out and you need to be supplemented with medication. And lastly, the systemic autoimmune diseases, again, which myositis is one of them, but so are the other diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, systemic sclerosis, and I think there's about 150 of them right now. So what are the possible environmental triggers for these autoimmune diseases? And one thing that the doctors may say is, well, maybe you got a virus, and that virus did something to your immune system to cause it to attack yourself. And we know that bacteria and viruses are possible of doing that. There's also the non-infectious causes, and those might be things such as foods. Um, there was a, a big uh, thing uh, not too long ago, and you all remember this because people were taking a medicine, or it was a nutricle, nutraceutical, a supplement called L-tryptophan. Did anybody take L-tryptophan about 10 years ago? It was used to help you to try to get to sleep. And a lot of people took it. And it started causing this illness called eosinic myalgia syndrome, where your immune system started you to thicken your skin and cause fibrosis. It looked like a disease called scleroderma. Various uh, types of uh, biologic medicines cause problems, and vaccines can trigger diseases in some uh, people. Very, very rare and very uncommon, and that's why Part of what happens is when we get vaccinated, a fraction of the cost get put into this really big fund. It's a vaccine injury fund so that if you can show you are hurt by a vaccine, there's money to compensate you. Also, um, I lost my track of thought there. Oh, uh, medical devices. So silicone implants. Does, do people know what I mean when I say silicone implants? Some say yeah. Come on, we know what that is. Breast implants. Yeah. So for a while, people were, women were having implants were filled with the bags full of silicon. And silicon, these bags would rupture, are powerful stimulators of the immune system. And for a while, the FDA banned silicone. It was only a few years ago that they allowed them back on the market with a better surveillance and better bags so that they wouldn't burst. Um, occupational exposures, now silica is probably the best studied. That relates to home construction, cement products, bricks, things like that. Every day we get exposed to a little bit. Of, that's been very well studied and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And there's other things that we need to worry about. And, People with a DM, raise your hand. Okay, I'll have to look at your skin to see if you're wearing, what are you supposed to be wearing? Sunblock, Sun yep. So your faces should kind of be what? Pale, they should be kind of be whitish. Why? Because sunblock is titanium oxide. You know the people with their noses that are red or white on the beach? That's what it, that's titanium oxide. And so the sun blocks, block sun. They don't let anything through. So you really should be kind of pasty white. But we really don't use that the way that we should because it's really not that attractive. And I should be using it too, and I was in the sun. Now my face is all red. So it's important for us to watch the amount of sun exposure we get. Ultraviolet B, B stands for bad. Here's an example of classic arthritis in goats. Probably don't have goats, but sometimes it's really good that our researchers study animals. And so this goat can get a virus, and this virus causes classic arthritis in it. 
Here's another disease called fifth disease. Has anybody ever had a child with fifth disease? Because it's actually quite common where young children get this red, they would call it a slap cheek sign, and they get aches and pains and their joints swell up, and they feel miserable. Looks like just like rheumatoid, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. But it's caused by parvovirus, parvovirus B19, B19 specifically. So that's a good example of, an, of a virus causing a arthritis in young children. But that also can be a given to the adults as well. That's one of the things we check when we see a new patient with new onset arthritis. And here's a graph that shows what's happening with some infections and what's happening with autoimmunity. And I think it really is, a, is an important point to show that this is the percentage or the incidence of the disease, how many new cases are there. And this is the time over the last 50 years. Rheumatic fever, measles, mumps, hepatitis A, tuberculosis, they're all on the decline. We're, we have better control of these diseases. We have better therapy for the diseases. We vaccinate for the diseases. And look how low, look how well we do with them. We've done very, very well. There's still room to go, but on a whole, it looks good, doesn't it? But look what's happening with autoimmune diseases. Multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, and asthma. And a lot of those are attributed to things in the environment. Environmental exposures of things people breathe, specifically in the newborn, that's triggering reactive airway disease or asthma. So while we're doing really well in one sense, we're not doing well in another sense. A good example of, of how diseases can be helpful for us is polio. Polio, remember a long time ago, was a disease of the wealthy, not of the common. Because in the commonplace people in, in the United Kingdom, they shared the virus Kids got a little bit of sick, but enough for their immune system to protect them. Where the wealthy didn't get exposed to it and didn't pass the virus along. And when they did get it, they got very sick. So here's an example of how bacteria, of bacteria and viruses can be helpful. So if you can actually take mice, and you take mommy when she's pregnant, and raise her in a very clean environment, as clean as possible, and when the babies are ready to be born, you take the babies by cesarean section. And you put the babies in a completely germ-free environment. So those babies don't get exposed to any viruses, any bacteria, as, as germ-free as humanly possible that we can do that. And here, these are the conventional bred mice. And this is in a mouse system where they get diabetes. And in a normal situation, the onset of diabetes is somewhere around 20%. By after about 40 weeks, almost half of the mice will have diabetes. But if we take those mice and they're not exposed to any bacteria or viruses, look what happens. By 40 weeks, almost three in four mice will have diabetes. So while some bacteria and viruses may hurt us, there are a lot of bacteria and viruses that help us. And if we can form an appropriate response to that, then our bodies are OK. What we're learning now is there's a very important virus out in the world right now in Africa that we don't want to get. But if we survive it, we're probably immune to it. Anybody guess which one I'm talking about? The Ebola virus. Yep. So this is not something of old. This is happening right now. Xenobiotics is another word that I want you to use because we all go to cocktail parties and we all want to impress our friends. And you probably want a word, well, oh, look, I wonder what kind of xenobiotics are in their food. So, you know, just throw that out whenever you want. Have some fun. People are going to look at you strange. Well, these are chemicals that are found in the environment that are not produced by the human body, but we add them. If you take any soda and look at it, there's an awful lot of xenobiotics in there to help keep the, the, with the fizz, with the preservatives, and all of the things. So 
hopefully those are, don't hurt us, but you know, they potentially could too. And so xenobiotics can influence the immune system. And there are some of these xenobiotics or these chemicals that cause antibodies to be formed. Well, that tells me that that xenobiotic, that chemical is doing something we probably don't want it to do in our body. It's making our immune system think about it, and it'd be best not to think about it. And here are some animal models in which the chemicals cause disease that look like autoimmune disease. So mercury is there. So who has mercury thermometers at home? One, two, three. So a few of us, do we want them at home? No. You know how that mercury was so cool to play with when we were kids? Man, I love playing with it. I thought that was the neatest stuff there was. But it's highly neurotoxic. Highly, so we don't want that around. Now I don't know how, it seems I think women are not allergic to gold, but <laughs> apparently there are some problems with it. And they can cause a disease called immune complex kidney disease or inflammation of the kidneys. The mercury can cause autoantibodies and resemble a lupus-like disease. Penicillamine is a drug that actually we use to treat some autoimmune disease, and that can cause an illness called myasthenia gravis, where the immune system is causing um, some antibodies that will cause our muscles to get weak. And then there's procainamide. This is an older medication that is still in use, not as much as before, but would cause a uh, problem causing a lupus-like state in animals, but not just animals, humans as well. So if I saw a referral with lupus and they were on procainamide, first thing we did was get them off. What other chemicals can be associated with autoimmunity? And I can go on and on and on. And there's a lot of things that we think about may cause problems, but proving it is really, really tough. For example, does smoking cause problems with our health? How do we know that? Did we arrive at that overnight? Or did it take decades to prove that? It took a long, long time. And now we know that through large epidemiologic studies that they're harmful. And the science has become so sophisticated that we can determine that more quickly than we could in the past. But one of the diseases that I talked about, lupus, is really the the, the, the foremost autoimmune disease and that looks like almost any organ can become involved with inflammation from the immune system. And I put estrogen up here as well because estrogen we, we really worry about with lupus. But again, lots of different medications. Scleroderma, that's a disease where the skin becomes very thickened, they get bad lung disease, the whole GI tract gets stiff and thickened. You can't really absorb it. It's a, it's a deadly disease. Things that cause your white blood cell count or your red blood cell count to go low are listed up here. And even penicillin, and some pe penicillin, penicillin can cause lysis of the red blood cells in a few, few people. So there's a, a big problem when you take antibiotics. A lot of people break out in rashes, which is an allergic response, but some people can have a more severe reaction. People with kidney disease caused by some of the things that I talked about earlier. Um, so there's really no good association with myositis. So I can stop right here and I can say, I don't know. And I'll ask you, does anybody know what the environment does to, for people to cause myositis? It would be nice that wherever the study was done looking at specifically in children, and I might show some of that to you. But really, there's nothing that's hard and held. But for sure we know the sun, ultraviolet B light, will worsen your disease, specifically dermatomyositis. But even with polymyositis, it can worsen your disease. So trust me on the sunblock. I think there's a song about that. Now, 
clearly genes are very, very important. And I put this slide up because I know that you are all really interested in the genetics and we can go through each gene one by one, okay? Does that sound like a good thing? Anybody any questions about this one? So these are our genes. So my first question are, is this a, the genes, the genotype, is this from a, a boy or a girl? X, Y. It's a boy. What would a girl be? X, X. Yep. So some, gene, some diseases actually can be found on these chromosomes and it, and it tracks well. It makes it easy if something is just found in men or just found in women. So when you do the genetic studies, you know, that, that's a big clue where you can find the gene. But here are listings of gene number one all the way through 22. Remember, we have pairs of these. And these are various types of autoimmune disease. Multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, um, psoriatic arthritis or psoriasis, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, insulin-dependent diabetes, and we have animal models for that. And they find that certain genes can be found to have something in that region on that chromosome to be important to that disease. So that's kind of a hot area in science is we want to know what genes are important. And the way that we do this is something through a gene-wide association study called a GWAS. And that's one of the things they want to do in myositis. So they are trying to get enough samples to do it. The higher the number of samples, the better your results will be. If you have a million, that's great. But 15 years ago, it cost a million dollars to sequence one, pe one person. It's too expensive. Now to do it for one person, probably get it down to like $500 or $1,000. It's come way down in cost. But you still want thousands of people. And I think the numbers with myositis is are we're, we're under 2,000 right now. So and that's all of the investigators pooling all the resources and all the DNA to try to come up with numbers that are meaningful. The thing is, we want patients that are kind of similar, because if the diseases are all different types, you get all these different genes, and it's hard to decipher. So do you want DM? Do you want PM? Do you want IBM? Do you want kids? Do you want adults? Do you want people that don't have good diagnosis? So it's hard to do these kind of studies, and it's expensive, and you need a lot of patients. But genes are very, very important. So what is some of the evidence that the environment does it? So what are some of the rules that you look for? Is that really important in, in the disease? And one is, well, <clears throat> if you take identical twins, so maternal identical twins, those twins have the exact same genes, right? Not every twin gets the same disease. So for example, with lupus, maybe about one in four twins. You can have one twin that has lupus and the other one doesn't. So how can that be? Same genes, it's got to be the environment. So there's a study done by Dr. Miller who are looking for twins where one has an autoimmune disease, it'd be great to get myositis, where one has it and one doesn't. And so he's looking for that. And they've actually published some results with the various genes they've already looked at, models. And then, well, one, if you take a disease that's, say, on a drug or in an environment, and you take them away from that, what happens? It should get better, right? And if you take that person or whatever chemical it is, and you reintroduce it, what should happen? It should come back. So that's kind of a rule that you gotta, gotta follow too. And lastly, you want to see if you can um, provide 
the evidence in animal models to reproduce all this. So when you look at what causes things, you have certain rules that you really want to follow to make sure the environment's the cause for it. So what do we know about myocytes? Well, just the background, because you already know that. It's a group of diseases whose hallmarks are chronic muscle weakness from inflammation. We don't know the cause. And look at the numbers, 0.01%. So when you apply for grants, you, you fudge your numbers. You might want to use 0.02%. Or you, you want to play that. There's a lot out there. But having a rare disease is both good and bad. It's good in the fact that the National Institutes of Health and some organizations are really, really interested in rare diseases. Because the rarer you are, pharmaceutical companies get a little extra help from the FDA. But the bad side is, is so if they do find something, then we've got to pay through the nose to get it. It's incredibly expensive. Um, you know the three most common types, DM, PM, and IBM. And it's a bunch of problems that we all go together. But remember, it's not just the muscles that get involved. There are other organs as well. So this is the best thing that I can tell you about the environment and dermatomyositis. And this was Dr. Miller working with other groups. And they looked at satellite imagery and how much ultraviolet light different regions of the world received. And so they looked at Guatemala, Mexico City, Guadalajara. What do they have in common? They're really close to the equator. Glasgow, Stockholm, what are they in common? There's far away as they can get. So you look at the relationship to the equator. And then they have all of the cities in between, including our group from Bethesda, from our patients with myositis. And we look at the percentage of people who have dermatomyositis and we correlate about how much sun exposure the patient would get per year. And they look at the incidence or the number of patients that totally have myositis and the percentage that have dermatomyositis. And if you lived in the, along the equator, you'd have a higher likelihood of having dermatomyositis than if you lived in Stockholm, where you have a much higher likelihood of having polymyositis. So there's something about living close to the equator or far away that influences what type of illness you get, and it's most likely the sun, and it's most likely the ultraviolet lights, because we know ultraviolet light causes problems. But this is direct evidence from around the world looking at large populations to kind of prove it. Then you can debate it if that's, you want to believe that or not. Now, I did a study that you can't see, and so I'll just sit here and confuse you. Um, but essentially, what we did is, I went through the world's literature, and I found all the studies that a group of us thought were reasonable studies. That means the studies had a, a large enough sample population of patients that had a control group. And control groups are incredibly important. So if you want to look at studies, and the first thing you should always ask yourself is, what was the control group that they used? Because I can say, well, that cup of coffee causes myositis. So say, oh, how do you know? I said, do you have myositis? Yeah. You drink that coffee? Yeah. Am I wrong? Well, what about that person? You drink that coffee? Yeah, you have myositis? No. Oh, the control group doesn't get it. So it's a little more complicated. So I looked at the largest studies, well-controlled uh, studies that we felt were of quality. And we looked for exposures. So this is silica, this is pesticides, solvents, mineral oil, um, mercury, and fumes. And, and why did we pick that? Because basically those were the studies that had the best data. There isn't studies out there with mercury or gold or anything that looked at autoimmune diseases. So there are huge, huge holes in, in our knowledge of autoimmunity and environment. We, we have to do better. And that's why at the NIH, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences exists. 
And so if I was the director of NIEHS, where would I want to put the majority of my funding? Would I want to put it into common diseases or rare diseases? No opinions? And then you get the job done. You won't really want to go after common diseases because that does affect the majority. Are you going to go after kidney cancer or breast cancer? Breast cancer. And so recruiting patients is really hard for these studies. And we've been recruiting patients for Dr. Miller's study for more than a decade. And we don't have that many patients. But on one day, there's a study that looks for siblings where one woman has breast cancer and the other one doesn't. And in one day, they had over 10,000 people enrolled because the study was put on a tel television show. Anybody know what show that might have been? Oprah, yep, bingo. So if you get on Oprah, you're gold. So we gotta fight to get our studies on Oprah, whatever the big shows are that are out there. So. It's also good to have um, people in uh, celebrities or well-established places because you can get a disease and Joe Schmo can't really do that much, but you know, Angelina Jolie can do a lot. But we continue to fight and we continue to try because you gotta crawl before you walk, before you run. And this group with TMA has advanced so much because of each person here. So let's continue that fight, and I thank you for that. So let's look at silica. And you can see that silica has been the best study because there are the most number of diseases studied. And this is rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, systemic sclerosis, blood vessel disease called vasculitis or ANCA. And uh, uh, there's, so there's four vasculitis, three systemic sclerosis or Sjogren's, two lupus, and two rheumatoid arthritis. And these were studies that were done all around the world. And I look at what's called the odds ratio or the relative risk. And the odds ratio or relative risk is really something like um, it's gambling. So you're all going out there to, the, to play poker, right? And you want to know, well, what are my odds of actually winning? Well, the odds are against you, right? If they're for the house, that's how the house makes money. But if you're lucky, you know, you can. You can win it big and you better walk away because the odds are that you're going to lose it. So we look at the odds. And the odds, basically, if the odds are 50-50, it's one. If the odds to the player are better than the houses, it's less than one. If the odds are better for the house, then it's greater than one. And generally, when you look at scientific studies, you want to know what the odds ratio of relative risk is, plus you want to know how good is that number. And so the scientists give a range. And they'll say, well, it's 1.3 plus or minus 0.4. So the range is from 0.9 to 1.7. So does that range cross 1? Yes. If it crosses 1, it's not statistically significant and by chance alone might be a finding. You want the number, the range to not cross one. Then it becomes meaningful. And all studies should have that. So if you look at these things, rheumatoid arthritis, they look at crystal silica exposed in men, and here they have an odds ratio and the range. And the range is above one. So they think that silica is important there. Here you have a study that didn't give the range or the range was just so tight that it didn't cross one. And here's one where it almost touches one. And here's one, this is lupus above, below, on, crosses, above. And you can see where the numbers are. So some studies say they're important and some studies say they're not. That well, makes it very, very confusing. So does it or doesn't it? Well, it depends on what study, how much exposure, how old were you, this, that, and the other thing. So when it comes down to the environment, it's incredibly hard to do these studies. You need large numbers, and then you've got to put it together to see what it means. 
So the bottom line of this is maybe some of these chemicals, solvents, fumes are important. Maybe they're not. And you can decide whether you want to take the chance or the risk based upon the science that's out there. But clearly, I think silica is a big risk. Now, very few studies have looked at myositis. And the studies have looked at kind of basically three things. One is parvovirus, and that's the most recent study that the questionnaire was asked, looking at kids that got juvenile dermatomyositis. Did they have parvovirus? And you can actually test for parvovirus by blood test to see if they've had it. You can see if it's an active or a distant uh, infection as well. And they looked at rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile inflammatory arthritis, which is a name for rheumatoid or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and juvenile dermatomyositis. And here you can see, this looks like it's probably important, but it crosses one. So, you know, maybe it's associated, but still, you know, it could be better. Here it says, yeah, I think it's important. In juvenile disease, maybe not so. And in juvenile dermatomyositis, it would suggest that it's protective. So if you got parvovirus, you probably of getting juvenile dermatomyositis is less. However, it touches one and it loses its association. So the studies are kind of all over. If you look at having an upper respiratory tract infection the year before you get sick, is that important? And you'd kind of intuitively say, yeah, I think it would be. All right, so let's do the study. They asked questionnaire and they asked the siblings in the family if they got sick, did they get the disease? So they did have a control and they found that actually those who got sick had a less likelihood of getting illness. So they go figure. And then lastly, streptococci. So strep, strep infections can be on the skin. Strep pneumonia cause bad pneumonia. So strep infections, very common, you see it a lot. Can that cause childhood myositis? And look at that. That suggests that maybe it does. Well, maybe we should be careful with skin contamination, washing our hands, keeping the kids clean, impetigo and things such as that are kind of staph infections, but can be associated with strep as well. So we wonder if streptococci could be important with this disease. And people with sore throats, they generally do, what do they do? They do a strip culture. So they're looking if they've had strep infections to cause the disease. So that's as good as it gets with, my, with myositis. There are other things to remember. I've talked to you about the sun and ultraviolet rays. I've talked about, you know, mom was right. Eat right, sleep right, exercise. Don't do everything in excessive. Take, take it in moderation. So don't worry about things as much as we should. Use your medications correctly. You know, with myositis, one of the best cases I ever saw was a, was a muscle builder. This guy was built like the Hulk. He had the most beautiful uh, girlfriend I've ever seen. And what was the picture that they had of, of the both of them? He's flexing, is where is she? Sitting on his shoulder, right? A classic pose. And now he's up in a bed in the NIH. He can hardly move. So I wondered if all the anabolic steroids that he was taking may have done something to it again. But your first question is, well, do you have the controls? What about the control cases? Diet, when we think about the things we eat, and other traumatic events, deaths, births, accidents, illnesses, do those influence disease? Don't too little in excess. Remember, take care of ourselves. Moderation, eat right, sleep right, exercise, do things in moderation. So what can we do to limit our exposures to all these things like that? And, and I can't tell you the right thing to do because how do you not stress? If you can't sleep, what do you do? You start taking pills for it. If you can't eat because you can't swallow well, what do you do? And my advice is do the best you can. If a doctor takes you and puts you on medications, take them. If you don't want to take them, don't tell the doctor you're not 
you're not taking them. I mean, tell the doctor the truth. Say, I don't want to take them. Why? Because I'm worried about side effects. Okay? If the doctor thinks you're taking them and you're not, and you're not getting better, what's he going to do? He's going to increase the dose. Well, that's no good. And the best thing that I can give you is sunblock, sunblock, sunblock. Really be careful of the sun. That's the most important. And this is the study I want to tell you about. So we study the environments in fluid on four diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, scleroderma, and myositis. Both children are and adults are welcome into this study. And they look for things like genes. They look at how the genes interact. They ask, Tom, how many questions did we ask you? for about four hours. So the four hours, to fill, probably yeah. a thousand questions. Yeah. And, uh, and we follow you, we follow you for five years. So we want to know about Tom, and we want to know about Tom's brother. And we want to know what the chances that Tom's brother is going to get disease. So we follow you over a period of time. Five years probably isn't long enough, but it's the best we can do because we don't have infinite funds and we don't have infinite number of people to help. So we do the best we can with what we have, and then we go from there. The highest quality of work that we can do is where we have twins, because those are genetically similar. And that takes the genetic part out and helps us to focus on the environment more. So those are the most ideal. But we take one person who has the disease, a sibling who doesn't have and we learn from that best we can. With that, I think we have a few minutes left, and uh, I'll answer some questions the best that I can. We have a question over here. Thank you. Absolutely, and we hear that time and time again, sick building syndrome, where the new buildings are hermetically sealed and closed ventilation, and we have all of these new things in the carpeting. You know, that's pure chemical. Desks. Chairs, lighting, walls, drywall, full of silica. All these things are chemicals put together in a closed building. And so that's a very, very common, very common scenario. And that's why we need to do these studies. You know, it doesn't range just from sick building syndrome, but along the Mississippi, there are clusters of people who drink the water and where outbreaks of scleroderma have occurred. Very, very rare diseases. Well, what's the likelihood of that happening? And so those are great cases to study. But unfortunately, there's not the manpower or the money to do that. And again, if you're the director, where do you put your money? Put your money where the money gets the most bang for the buck. So, you know, we fight. We could join organizations. We talk to important people. We want them to listen to us and hear our voice. And we're not going to stop. We're going to keep banging on your door until you listen. And so that's your job and my job, to bound, pound the drum. Never give up. Other questions? Warrants genetic testing? Do you want to wait for the mic? Sure. Well, I'll repeat the question. What warrants genetic testing? And that's a million dollar question. And my answer would be everybody. But we clearly can't do everybody. And I'll give you an example. So when I see referrals at the NIH and, and I think there's something going on, one of my personal opinions is uh, I think that inclusion body of myositis might actually in some people be a form of muscular dystrophy. And we've shown that in some patients. And so we can do genetic testing on certain genes on people. Say there's a dystrophy panel we can send the blood off and it costs like $1,500. And they give us a report and they said, we looked at these 12 genes and this is what we found. Now you can do an entire genome for about $800. So a genome, so here, people, who has a computer in their house? Come on. Any computer, yeah. Who has a cell phone? Okay, all that has memory in it, right? And we talk about megabytes and gigabytes. 
When we do a, gene, a whole genome, it gives us terabytes, thousands of gigabytes of information. So doing the sequencing of every gene is easy, but coming up with the results and going through and sifting all that, that's the hard part. But there are certain areas where the computer program will look at for certain hot spots, so to speak. So I think we should get all genetic testing on the entire genetic structure that we have. And that we would carry around to show different investigators, and they can load that into their computer, and they can look for certain genes. But that's me. So when does it warrant? When things don't seem right, when we go see specialists and we get second opinions and we think, could this be something genetic? Well, you really want to know what's out there that mimics this that's genetic and then be tested for that gene. Then I think it's reasonable to have that done and to go after it. Question here. Have there been any studies done about the location of people who have various kinds of bronchitis <coughs> And if there had been such a study, and you found the preponderance of the population, would that give you any clues as to where to look? So if I understand the question is, if we had a large incident number of patients with polymyositis and Baton Rouge in 2010, would that be helpful to go to Baton Rouge and to talk to those patients find a control group in the same area and to see if we can find environmental exposures that predispose them to dermatomyositis? And the answer is absolutely, that would be, that would be the way to go, yeah. Because therefore, and people are doing that. So I have a colleague who was up in Boston and who studied an underserved indigent area to see if lupus was higher there, had a control group and had the patients and wanted to know what in the environment is causing illness there. And I don't know the results, but those types of things are very good and powerful studies. Absolutely. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Oh, last question, right here. Okay. We'll finish with a comment. Okay. That, that it has uh, the group, I don't know, the TMA or NIH. Uh, John Hopkins and place, but the use of just graduate students that are looking for uh, research programs, um, looking at the trends, like here, you know, we need to find if this is a trend with the uh, bad building syndrome, a trend with some of these exposures, but that wouldn't um, take as much of the medical research folks' time and then, you know, monitoring, but it seems like there's graduate students that are always looking for projects, and, you know, this seems like it's not very costly, and um, that would be a use of some time. Yeah, that's a wonderful idea. The issue with that is when graduate students go and postdocs or research fellows go and look at projects and things to do, they need to be funded. Their salary needs to be funded. And depending on where you live, you know, a research fellow probably at the NIH is making you know, $70,000 or something like that. So you still have to come up with their salary and support them. So in total, if you wrote a grant, you'd probably want $100,000 a year. So it's really not trivial. But you know, this organization, TMA, gives money out to those who apply and that go through. Uh, so we just went through a bunch of grants. We peer review them. And we rank them to see, do they stand uh, the grandma test, or, the, the, or do they stand the the, the strength, the weaknesses, can this be done in a timely fashion, stuff like that. And then we give out an award. It might be hundreds of thousands of dollars for someone to go ahead and do the research study. Now, the thing is, we'll never have enough money. And you know, that's why TMA is always banging on the door and doing whatever they can to raise, raise money, because it's your money. And uh, if we don't support it, I mean, we look to the government, the government doesn't have enough money, and, and they're going to support breast cancer more than they're going to do myositis, unless we have a senator who's, whose loved one gets myositis, and all of a sudden we probably get a big kick in it right there. So it's, it requires your help, you and me, 
need to help our organization become strong. And the way it becomes strong is through money and talking to people, knocking on doors, and we need to let people, the world know who we are and uh, we need help. Can I one more? Sure. My family primarily grew up in the Central Valley, the Nesco, Merced area, a lot of uh, agriculture there. And uh, I grew up in the uh, Monterey area uh, around Salinas. It, is there any studies being done on autoimmune diseases on field workers and their families, possibly? Where you know, I, I, I remember driving by miles of strawberry fields. And all of the neighborhoods were to the east of these these fields where the wind was blowing, and they had a, a row of oleander about ten feet high. Like maybe they were trying to protect them. Like that. Any, any studies on auto? Yeah. So looking for autoimmune diseases and pesticide solvents, uh, 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 um, people working in the agricultural business. Yeah, those those are underway and they're being done. But again. Uh, you wait for the published results, and then you want to ask the questions. You really want to be tough on the study to make sure they did everything they've done correctly with the appropriate control group and, and look at all those things. But all those studies uh, are, are being done. Now, I'm 56 years old, and I think there's maybe one or two that are older than me. I grew up in North Dakota, and one of the best things that I loved about this was the summers. Because what did we have in North Dakota? State bird is the mosquito. And what do we have drive up and down the streets in the evening? The mosquito truck spraying DDT. What would all the kids do? Run behind it. So, you know, at that time we thought it was safe, but then all the birds went away. So it probably wasn't the best thing for us to do. Things change, we get smarter. Um, with that, I conclude, thank you for your time and your good questions and listening, and enjoy the rest of the conference.